coming up in this edition of the 2018 FIFA World Cup magazine, it's destination Volgograd. We chart the rise and fall of Rosa Football Club. And we meet the first Soviet footballer to play in the West. Founded in 1929, Rota is a name synonymous with football in southern Russia. An amateur club these days, in the mid-1990s, Volgograd's finest was one of the strongest teams in the Russian Premier League, twice finishing runners-up. They even enjoyed some memorable nights on the European stage, most notably against Manchester United in 1995. Having drawn the first leg nil-nil in Volgograd, we flew to Manchester feeling confident that we would get the right result. On the pitch at Old Trafford, in that famous arena, we played a great game, which would later enter the history books. That match was a huge occasion, not just for football in Volgograd, but for the Russian game as a whole. At the end of the first half, we were leading 2-0. For their part, I think Manchester United underestimated us. In the second half, we had a hard time keeping up with them. By the end of the match, we could barely fend off Manchester United's attacks. They were relentless. Peter Schmeichel scored from a corner in the last minute. The game ended 2-2, but we qualified for the next round on away goals. Words can't even begin to describe how I felt. You needed to be there to really appreciate the emotion of the occasion. At that moment, we didn't realise what it actually meant, what we had done for football in Volgograd, how much of a lift this victory over a club as great, truly as great as Manchester United, would give to football in our city. You may have seen that well-known photo of the whole team in the changing room after the game. I came across the photo just the other day. I don't remember who took it, but if you look at the expression on my face, I was completely stunned. The 90s was a time when everything just clicked. We had a president who lived and breathed football, and we had a good selection of players, helped by excellent coaches. Eliminated by eventual finalist Bordeaux in the second round of that season's UEFA Cup, Rota was soon in decline. Within a decade of that famous victory, due to financial irregularities and poor management, Rota was declared bankrupt. Between 2005 and 2014, the club reformed several times, but bad debts have meant they've had to voluntarily fold on numerous occasions. Last season, they reformed once again as Rota Volgograd in the fourth tier of Russian football. I came here on April the 10th and the team was assembled from scratch only two days prior to the beginning of the new season. It was like putting a new boat in the water, setting sail and having no idea whether it was going to go forwards or backwards. After the series of problems that plagued the club during the 2000s and given the many changes to the squad and the lack of finances, we've had a hard time. There's been a negative attitude at times this season because we've been playing in an amateur league, but we tried our best and only lost our very first game. After that, we won 20 matches and drew once and ended up lifting the title. It's more than an accomplishment for me because every coach who lives in the Volgograd region dreams of working with Rota, as this name means a lot to us, both as a brand and a regional symbol. As for the team, I think it was quite an accomplishment for them too, because even if some people say it's only amateur football, getting promoted is still an important step for the development of the club. The second division is a whole new level of football. It's professional. We will look to maintain our status and then look to go up. Hopefully we'll be able to keep the current squad, or at least 60% of it, together. That said, I think we will need another 5 to 10 new players to strengthen the team. We need to prepare for the new season thoroughly so that it can be as successful as the previous one. 
Maybe this new stage that we're about to embark on will end with Rota returning to where we want the club to be, which is a return to the glory days of the 1990s. Eleven of Russia's cities will host the 2018 tournament. Here to tell us about her hometown is the world's preeminent pole vaulter. Hi, I'm Yelena Isinbayeva, two-time Olympic champion. I have set 28 world records. I'm a seven-time world champion, a two-time European champion, and the first woman in the world and in the history of field athletics to vault five meters. As a tourist and guest of our city, during the World Cup, you have to go and visit Mamai Hill. Another must-see is the Battle of Stalingrad Museum. You should also go to the embankment on the east side of the Volga River. On the west bank, there's a lovely beach and a wonderful forest where tourists can escape from the hustle and bustle of our city during the World Cup. We also have the old Sarepta Museum, another option for escaping the city centre. All in all, there are plenty of interesting places to visit. And so to Sarepta, a settlement on the Volga River, where German colonialists were allowed to set up home in the mid-18th century. Today, it is indeed one of Volgograd's leading tourist attractions. This is the old Sarepta Museum. It is the place where the one and only Russian settlement of her Hunter brothers was founded 250 years ago. The whole museum complex is made up of 26 buildings, many of which date back to the end of the 18th century. Now considered a place of historic importance, the museum allows you to learn about the settlement's unique history and what life was like for those first settlers. This is the old church, and it was built in 1772. It was fully restored in 1995, and 10 years ago, people from the German city of Cottbus sent the church a wonderful gift, an organ, which is now one of the main attractions. The church is an active one, with weekly religious services organized by the Evangelical Lutheran community of Sarepta. The services are held both in Russian and German, and are accompanied by the sounds of the organ. The museum also houses the German library, which offers its visitors a selection of non-adapted books in the German and English languages. Visitors are free to peruse them. A jewel of the library's collection is a 19th century copy of a multi-volume Gothic script encyclopedia. Sarepta was a very well-developed settlement. They had several small industries, a candle-making factory, a tannery, a wine distillery, a pottery shop. But the main and the most important industry based here was devoted to the production of mustard oil and mustard powder. It is in Sarepta that the first ever mustard oil was produced in our country. By the middle of the 19th century, this settlement was the mustard capital of the whole Russian Empire. There are a number of old wine cellars which were built at the end of the 18th century. Sarepta settlers used to harvest several varieties of grapes, most of which were used in wine production. Some secrets of Sarepta wine have stood the test of time. Cellars like this can be found under every Sarepta building, and there is a legend that all these cellars used to be connected through underground passages. In addition, such places have given birth to numerous other myths. One of them is that this cellar is haunted by benevolent ghosts. And so, upstairs, visitors will find a mug of beer and a loaf of bread left for the ghost of a kind-hearted Johannes.
With the FIFA World Cup approaching, an iconic stadium is taking shape in Volgograd, one that will leave a lasting impression for future generations. The construction itself started in November 2014. We had to dismantle the old stadium and then clear the area of the old utility systems. So far, we've completed the first three essential stages of the project on schedule. We've completed the foundations for the stadium, which required more than 57,000 cubic meters of concrete. That's 50% of the concrete for the project. It has taken a lot of effort and hard work. And although we've managed to stay on schedule so far, we understand that later on we might encounter some problems. To combat this, our primary task at the moment is to get ahead as much as we possibly can. At the moment, there are almost 700 people working on the project, and there are more than 89 pieces of heavy machinery on site. In the plans for the stadium, we have also included a water recycling system. We want the arena to be as sustainable as possible. All the materials will be eco-friendly, and we have arranged to use materials that will help us minimize heating expenses in winter and air conditioning costs in summer. The deadline for completion for the stadium is November 2017. It never occurred to me that people of a certain age, like those over 70, for example, would come up to me to ask how the stadium's construction is progressing. How's it going? Are we on schedule or not? I think this has to do with the stadium being located in a prime position at the bottom of Mamai Hill. It's also due to the patriotism of our population, which is especially characteristic in the elderly. I've also been speaking with school pupils, boys in particular, who keep saying, when will it be ready? When will it be ready? We want to play there. Each time you get a project, even though this is not the first project of such importance I've worked on, you come to treat it like your own child, and you long to see this child make its first steps into the adult world. I'm not the only one to feel this way. The whole team are keen not only to finish the work and leave, but to be able to see the stadium's transition to adulthood, so to speak. We're working at a very good rate, and I'm sure the stadium will be finished on time. So I think everything's going to be all right for the first match, and we're looking forward to it with great anticipation. When all the pieces of this 45,000 all-seater stadium are finally assembled, the Volgograd Arena will be ready to welcome the world. Twenty eighteen will mark Russia's eleventh appearance in the FIFA World Cup finals, and here to share his memories of the team's nineteen sixty six campaign is Vladimir Ponomaryov. During the 1960s, Vladimir Ponomaryov was an established member of the Soviet national team. Along with his teammates, the defender had high expectations heading into the FIFA World Cup finals in England. European champions in 1960, the USSR were drawn in a tough group with Italy, Chile and Korea DPR, who they faced in their opening game. They were a mystery. We had no idea how they played. It was impossible to watch any of their games before the finals. That was just how it was with the Koreans. I remember before the match, our coach, Nikolai Morosov, said to us, guys, you know I have some strange data about the Koreans. It says they all run the 100 meters in 10 seconds. How can this be? We told him, come on, coach, drop it. Don't pay attention to it. It's nonsense. No one can run that fast. Even though they were a big unknown, we were confident heading into the game. And their confidence was rewarded with a clinical 3-0 victory. 
After we beat Italy in our second match to progress to the quarter-finals, the Koreans were afraid that we might take it easy in our final game against Chile. The Koreans needed us to win to stand a chance of progressing themselves. Coach Morosov reassured them that, that this wouldn't be the case. He calmed them down and told them that we wanted to win and maintain our 100% record. The Chileans were a good team, but as history shows, we won. Our coach was right, and I think the Koreans were very happy. After topping their group, the USSR faced a talented Hungary in the quarter-finals. We were the underdogs in that game. Hungary had beaten Brazil 2-1 in the group stage. Everyone in the Soviet Union was sure we would lose because they'd beaten Brazil. We had no pressure on us heading into that game. Nobody thought we had a chance. But the underdogs had their day, securing a two-on victory to book a place in their first FIFA World Cup semi-final. After the Hungary match, the coach got us together. He said to us, thank you guys, you've done a great job. I don't think anybody will be able to come close to this result for 50 years. I think this was a big mistake on his part. Everyone relaxed. I can honestly say we lost focus. Subsequent defeats to West Germany in the semi-final and Portugal in the match for third place meant the USSR finished fourth. But almost 50 years on, as Morozov predicted, the exploits of Vladimir Ponomaryov and co remain the country's best ever FIFA World Cup showing. I can tell you that I still have dreams about the World Cup today. I wake up in a cold sweat. The World Cup was very stressful, but it left such an impression on me. It was an unbelievable experience and one I will always remember. This theatre was created in 1988 as the first experimental theatre in the Soviet Union, because, as you know back then, it was still the USSR. Imagine a new theatre appearing, which offers new artistic perspectives, new creative ideas, and new ways of resolving important social problems, even political ones. Therefore, we are something of a tuning fork for the quality of the theatrical scene, for its intensity, and its engagement with the audience. I used to dream about becoming a deep-sea captain or a hairdresser. There were lots of ideas I found fascinating, but then I realized that the only way to fulfill all of those was to become an actress. We usually consider theatrical performance to be an impassionate, steady, meticulous rendition of the original play. Now imagine doing exactly that, but in a rapid tempo. This is what we call an experiment, an unusual form of presenting a play or a part. You know, the first few years in the life of our theatre was a challenge. We had to help the audience get accustomed to the artistic language that wasn't familiar to them. Those years were the most difficult, but we managed to win over the audience. And since then, for the last 28 years, every evening has been sold out, 100% attendance, which is a rare occurrence for a theatre, not only in Russia, but anywhere in the world. The theatre is very spiritual. It's like a cathedral, like a church, because it's a place where the human spirit lives. Each performance should end with a feeling of release. That's what we're always trying to achieve. It doesn't happen every time, but when it does, the feeling is overwhelming, and it results from the combined internal efforts of the actors and the audience. Just like all the other people in our city, we look forward to welcoming the visitors who will come here during the World Cup in 2018. I hope that, apart from their sport-related activities, they'll also find some time to enjoy our cultural institutions 
and come to our theater. We'll do our best to ensure they have a memorable time. I, Anatoly Alexeyevich Zinchenko, a Soviet citizen, must behave in a way appropriate for a Soviet citizen in another country. I must uphold our values and behave in such and such a way. Those were the parting words. In 1980, Anatoly Zinchenko became the first Soviet footballer to transfer to a Western club. A midfielder, he played in Volgograd and St. Petersburg before making the unexpected move to Austria's Rapid Vienna. I must be honest and say that my career was drawing to a close and I was thinking about retiring as a footballer when this offer came through. Honestly, I found it hard to believe that I would be allowed to go to the West. At the time, players in the Soviet Union were all registered as amateurs. This made things more complicated when it came to organizing a contract to play in the professional Austrian Bundesliga. Firstly, they told me that my contract wasn't going to be arranged directly with Rapid, but through the sporting committee. I received my wage from the Soviet trade delegation as an electrical engineer whilst playing for Rapid Vienna. I just played football. I trained and played for Rapid, but on the official documents, I was listed as an electrical engineer. That was how it was dressed up. The most important thing was that I lived up to the expectations of the people who recommended me for the move. To be frank, at that time we were brought up on the principle that you had a duty to your country, to honour your club and to honour your flag. I managed to uphold these principles and to even exceed them by my achievements and the titles that I won. It was an honor for me to become a two-time league champion and an Austrian cup winner. In my Soviet career, there was no such success. I didn't win a single trophy. Zinchenko's name may not be widely known, but his move to Austria was a game changer. Since his time in Vienna, Russian players have won domestic and continental honors with clubs across Europe. It's a legacy to be proud of. I probably did contribute by being the first player to move to the West. After me, more of our players were approached to make the switch. Soviet fans also started to pay more attention to foreign teams, especially those where our players were represented. I remember Sergei Shavlo moved to Rapid Vienna. He also forged a good career there. I think my journey definitely contributed to a better overall attitude towards playing football in the West.